Tell Me How I Die is a clinical trial horror movie where the unnecessary exterior shots are plenty. And the plot holes were the death of me. Kind of like this picture that was mailed to my house. Kind of creepy. The picture, not the movie. Anyway, don't get your hopes up on this episode of Cinema Autopsy. and welcome to my channel and another episode of Cinema Autopsy. In this series we watch fictional horror content and splay it open like a cadaver on an autopsy table. We figure out what makes us love it, hate it, or send it to an unmarked grave. Today we jump into Tell Me How I Die. All 107 minutes, directed by DJ Viola and released in 2016. It is now streaming on Tubi. The movie jumps right into it with an exterior shot of a house and it's snowing outside. The snow looks like soap suds. I've lived where it snowed and even in a blizzard, the snow never quite looked like that. It does, however, look like that one time my roommate from college put too much soap in the dishwasher. The shots of outside, so like the exterior shots, don't seem to be filmed on location where the actors were. Mainly because there's no interaction of the actors in the wide panning shot. I didn't look up where this was filmed and if the shots were on location, it was too much research. Anyway, we see a man looking at sketches he found inside his desk drawer. The sketches portray a nefarious plot of his wife and young daughter's death. <clears throat> he walks out of his office and kisses his wife who is on the couch with their sleeping daughter. He goes to the kitchen and grabs a knife. He walks outside in sock clad feet. Now I've walked outside completely barefoot in snow before because I wanted to see what it felt like and it was weird because it's so cold you don't feel it until you go back inside where it's warm and your feet are like ice blocks. I don't really know what it feels like, but it was an interesting experience. Just hard to put into words. We get to see a very cinematic shot of the guy's bloody body lying in the snow next to one of the sketches, which explains why he did what he did. It is a fantastic shot, and I loved every second of it. So then we get the title slide, um, and after that we open to a cinema... Cin what? A seminar about a new drug that is supposedly going to help improve memory. Life. It's mankind's most precious resource. It's the one thing that every living creature on this earth wants more than anything else. Now, the primary purpose of medical science has always been to heal, to extend life. But what about improving the life we have? The speaker's accent changes more than I changed my underwear. One sentence, he sounds like Wesker from Resident Evil, and the next he sounds completely American. It could be his actual accent that sounds like a hodgepodge mix of all of those, but I've never heard one like it, so I guess it doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm just joking. Obviously, just because I never heard of it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So looking at these, they definitely filled the audience with blow-up dolls and mannequins. I wondered why they had such a drastic lens flare. So naturally, I looked at the scenes harder and found fake people in the audience. Uh, the drug, A9913, was created by Halloran Pharmaceuticals. And it promises memory increases of up to 300%, but it keeps failing in the trials. We meet Dr. Jerums after the sem seminar is over. His name sounds like Germ, and it definitely is revealing of his character. So anyway, he's talking to the speaker of the cinema seminar, <laughs> whose name we still don't know. 
Which is a big problem throughout the movie. Uh, give me the characters' names when they're introduced. Like, it shouldn't be a secret. So, Jeremy Boy reveals to the audience that the man in the beginning was the other doctor testing A9913, Dr. Rasmussen. Jeremy is socially awkward. The speaker compliments his intellect and his work on A9913, and then Jeremy starts using big scientific words to explain the newest compound of A9913 and how it is better than its predecessors, but still doesn't have a side effect rate that is scientifically insignificant. And throughout this whole conversation, this side effect is purposefully obscured. But if you read the description of the movie, you would know that it's premonition. The side effect is premonition. Jerem promises the next round of trials will be ready to submit to the FDA. The speaker pretty much says it better and then gets in his car like the posh billionaire he probably is. Next, we see a swanky college bar and we meet one of our main characters. She used to be a bartender at that bar and we find that out through a conversation she is having with the current bartender. She has a knack for knowing what customers are going to order. She's sarcastic here, but then we never see that aspect of her character again. At this point on the rewatch, I wondered if a9913 only made people with better than average memories pseudo-psychic, but then thinking about it, no. It has nothing to do with it. One guy is a card shark, um, she can deduce drink orders, but then it stops there. The other woman never mentioned anything about her memory, and the other guy who stole A9913 never said anything about memory either. I don't understand why or how she could deduce a drink order and why it mattered. They could have gone the whole excellent memory route and explained that she remembered the customer from a Tuesday a year ago or something like that. I feel like it was an idea that started to play out but they ended up cutting scenes that explain this further or they just forgot or didn't care. Her being at the bar was actually necessary to the plot because that's where we learn she needs money and gets the flyer for the clinical trial. Clinical trial. However, we don't see her motivation. Like, we don't know why she needs money. She just needs money. But then we meet another character. It's Freddy from iCarly! And he grew up attractive. <laughs> He takes his shirt off later in the movie and is wearing just a tank top so you see his buff arms. Go ahead, Freddy. Anyway, Anna, you don't know her name yet, but I'm tired of calling her she, the main woman character. She implies that she really needs money, but we're never told why. I mean, I guess it doesn't matter, but it could have added some depth to the character because her character was actually kind of flat. Anna shows up late to the orientation walking in like she owns the damn place and really doesn't need money that she just said she did in the last scene because I'm pretty sure in real life if you're late and they already started the orientation they wouldn't let you in. This movie kills me with how they introduce the main characters. They do introduce them early but then they don't give us the names. Like, the bartender could have easily said, Hey, Anna, and then said his lame little joke, and I would have been like, Okay, cool, her name's Anna. We got a name for this woman. And I wouldn't feel like this whole movie was an inside joke I wasn't privy to. <laughs> the female extra in this clip looks so uncomfortable. Don't worry, sis, I'd be uncomfortable too in an elevator with two guys I didn't know. So, Curtis, the head nurse takes the participants up to their dorms, giving them exposition and showing us a little bit of the supposed 200 acre facility. Was it 200? I don't know. It is now. Though we only see one building on this massive lot. So I, uh, so are we as to assume one building is 200 acres? Because woof, that's huge. Or are we supposed to be, or are there supposed to be other buildings sprinkled throughout these 200 acres. Your guess is as good as mine. 
I would have just left that part out of the script because now my brain is focusing on that and hoping we get to see it explained in one way or another, like one of the too many exterior shots. They cut to a lot of exterior shots. I get it, it's pretty scenery, but I feel like you're padding the runtime. This is where we meet Kristen with a K. I've never met a Kristen without a K, but okay. So we knew Kristen's name, we know Kristen's name, how she spells it, what she studies, but we don't know the main woman who we're following around this whole time. Make that make sense. No, but let me know when he calls. Germ is being gross. Why was he staring at her boobs in scrubs? Right before the awkward long pause, he just needs to get himself together. to do one it was quick and to the point this extra looks uncomfortable too and I totally get it I hate when people have a conversation over me um even though Freddie does move so at least he does do that but then he like cuts the guy in line so just shy of 19 minutes we ner learn that Freddie's name is dead and then we finally know Anna's name at just after 19 minutes so 19 minutes into the movie and I can finally stop calling her girl number one in my head. Anna's interaction with this tech is stiff. Let's watch. What is this supposed to do again? It's a hippocampus stimulator. What does that mean though? It stimulates the hippocampus. It works on a part of your brain that's associated with memory. The hope is it may help cure Alzheimer's, among other things. Woof. What does that mean, though? That line was delivered so dry, I got parched immediately after. I'm all for the sassy tech, though. Like, bitch, you didn't read the documents before you signed them? That is very important that you read all documentation you sign. Not only so you know what's expected of you and what you can expect from the entity who's in charge of the documents, but also because there could be juicy arbitra arbitration <laughs> clauses that could benefit you greatly. So, read those documents. Germ has a binder with an integrated calculator. I used to think those were so cool as a kid. My mom brought one home from work when I was a wee babe. And I'm pretty sure I played with it for hours. I was a lonely weird kid who grew up into a lonely weird adult. We get this warp speed time lapse. I do appreciate that they're speeding it up to get to the good parts. It did show some foresight, but that foresight was totally abandoned by the end of the movie. We'll talk about that later in depth. What are these billiard balls? How are you supposed to tell the difference between, like, yours and your opponent's? Anyway, Dennis playing the card shark and pool and get and they get just uh, down to just the eight ball. Den misses and shark also misses, but we find out that it was a vision. But he still misses the exact same way that he and the audience just saw. So then Curtis comes and takes him to germ. And then Kristen has a vision as well. Kristen and the car shark weren't supposed to talk to anyone about the side effects, but Kristen doesn't listen to this and tells everybody, the professional guinea pig, Anna, Den, and the card shark. At this point, we don't know the card shark's name or the professional guinea pig's name. So Anna kind of freaks out and tells Den that this isn't what she signed up for even though it is exactly what she signed up for. I'm pretty sure premonition wasn't listed as a side effect, but I'm sure there was a clause that said that there might be side effects that weren't listed. 
Anyway, she says she plans on leaving in the morning. Even though they're all explicitly told in the beginning that once they received the drug or the placebo that they couldn't leave the facility. The green screen work is rough throughout the whole movie. All of the green screen problems could have easily been solved with a different camera angle. Like in this car scene, they show the speaker straight on. It's fine. But then they do this awkward angle and it's like pointed at his ear and we get like the awful editing in the window. After an unnecessary slow pan of Anna, Anna's boobs while she is in bed, she has a vision of everyone in the woman's bunk room dying while she is in the bathroom. It was mustard gas and there was a bloodied 5260 on the window. Anna freaks, packs her things, and tries to leave. She causes a commotion so everyone comes out of their bunk rooms and then Curtis ends up sedating Anna. Curtis takes Anna to the doctor, Germ, and they leave her tied to a table in like the basement. Anna's side effect is different from Shark's and Kristen's because hers didn't happen right before the actual event. So either she's extra banana sandwich or she's more powerful. I'll give you a hint, it's neither. So at this point begins the deterioration of continuity and plot. Alan, the security guard, sees someone outside. He uses his walkie talkie and he thinks it's a certain person but that person doesn't answer and just walks away. It looks like Alan takes his radio with him, but later, when the other security guard is looking for him, he sees the radio still on the desk. I would have showed a separate shot of him putting the radio back down or cut the part of the guard seeing his radio. Almost halfway in and we finally see that there's a killer on the loose and we learn that a participant's name is Scratch, but we don't know who that is. At 45 minutes in, we find out the shark's name is Marcus when he, Kristen, and Den are sneaking around the facility. They end up behind the mirrored walls of their dorm and realize that it was a one-way mirror. They're acting all shocked that the wall was like fake mirrors. Like really? Any mirror is a one-way until proven otherwise in my book. Curtis dies. I hate this scene. Honestly. You can tell 100% that Curtis has like a gop of blood cupped in his hand before he slams it on the window. This also happens when the women die in the bunk room and one of them slams her hand against the window. I understand their go what they were going for, but there's nothing creepy or cinematic about someone dying and smearing a bloodied hand print on the wall. I hate it so much, especially when it's not convincing. Anna's struggle to get the cuffs off was about as convincing as the bloody handprint smear. In the close-ups, you can see she could totally get her hand out of the cuff. I'd have the cuffs tight so the struggle looked authentic. If the actor was claustrophobic or had anxiety about being completely cuffed, I'd just do one hand and film a close-up on only that one. Or like, you know, switch it off, do one hand at a time. Anyway, Anna gets free and has death visions of Marcus, Kristen, and Den. Meanwhile, those three were able to get outside and meet up with Scratch and get in Den's car. Den has a hide -a key under the body, which is relevant, relevant, what? Because they had to um, give their keys and phones at the beginning. So Marcus and Den argue over going back because Den doesn't want to leave everyone inside with a killer, even though we all know he has the awkward hots for Anna. This is kind of, this is the kind of budding relationship that I was talking about in my always watching autopsy. Ben likes Anna, so his character is motivated to help her, which puts himself in danger. However, I never felt any on-screen chemistry between them, but that could have just been my cold, dead heart. Marcus tells Den that he could just take his keys, and then the look Den gives him is just amazing. 
Den calls Marcus a coward and goes back into the building. So, of course, Marcus follows him to spite him. And then Kristen goes because she wants in Marcus's pants. Scratch is now the only one left outside in the car. So those three split up in the building for about a second and then get back together outside the woman's bunk room where Anna's vision finally came to fruition. Marcus explains that off camera, the men suffered the same fate. Kristen runs to the bathroom, separating from the group and gets chased and falls down a laundry chute filled with barbed wire. It is the most chaotic, shaky, choppy scene. Its quality looks like it belongs in a movie like Grave Encounters. Its quality just doesn't match the rest of the movie, even including the very obvious green screened windows. The rest of them run down to the basement where the shoot ends and we see that the killer set a trap that implying that he knew Kristen would end up down the chute. Dan brings up the point that someone who has taken the drug before would know what was going to happen. So Scratch is still in the car and reveals that the reason he was out of the dorm room was to steal drugs, one of which is A9913. So Dan, Marcus, and Anna are locked inside and decide to try and find Germ, who has been suspiciously absent since he left Anna tied to the table. We find that the guy I've been calling Halloran in my head all this time, who is the speaker, is actually Dr. Redmond Layton. An hour and 10 minutes into this movie. This movie is an hour and 47 minutes long. Why did they wait so long to tell me the name of the first character they introduced? So Scratch gets out of the car and has two visions back to back of his death because he took A9913. Other stuff happens, but he dies and it's not really relevant, relevant God damn, to the rest of this video. While the trio ransack Germ's office looking for clues as to where he might have gone, Den stumbles across a video conveniently left open on the desktop. It shows the doctor from the beginning, Germ, and patient 8, Pascal Dern. They kept injecting him with A9913 to see what would happen. As paraphrased. In the video, Pascal looks at the camera and asks Den if he figured out the writing on the bunk room wall. It was a cool use of um, time, or like passage of time, to show how powerful Pascal was, um, even more than they imagined, because Anna mentions the video was created six months ago. So then we learn that Pascal is the one who was leaving the drawing. So Dan and Anna come to the hypothesis that Anna is only having visions of the stuff she sees. So if they go to the biohazard bunker that Scratch mentioned, maybe the visions wouldn't come true because she hasn't seen the bunker. The guy who plays Marcus was giving a good performance. He had a lot of micro expressions that made his actions, words, and more obvious expressions believable. I would say it was better than the woman who played Anna. I don't think she used the top half of her face throughout the whole movie. Anyway, they find Germ hiding in the locked biohazard bunker. It turns out Pascal was using slash killing everyone to try and force Germ into killing himself but germ doesn't care about anyone else but himself like the disease producing microbe he is marcus suggests tying up anna so she couldn't see any of them die dan says hell no and then pascal starts banging on the door outside sending marcus into flight mode he hits anna with a convenient pipe and then he and dan start to tussle marcus gets stabbed in the struggle and kicks the bucket so Anna and Den now run to the roof and even though it's high there's a snow drift that could catch their fall. But it doesn't ease the blow of the biggest plot hole I've ever seen. They prepare to jump together and Den kind of pushes Anna and tells her to go get help. Is, 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 is why? 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 And the excessive exterior landscape shots did you not go to. The movie 
could have ended at an hour 32 minutes they could have done a last scene that shows like pascal in the rearview mirror of the car or the car blows up and leave it a cliffhanger however i did enjoy anna's struggle to open the door it's completely accurate with snow especially um even though they were setting up for a cheap unsuccessful jump scare this is where Dan takes his sweatshirt off unnecessarily, but I'm not mad at it because look at his buff arms. So Anna finds Scratch's body, the drugs, and then Kristen's body, which was different about how Kristen died in her vision. So she rams the building doors with the car, hustles down to ask Jeremy Boy why Kristen's death was wrong. Jerm says that visions are only a possibility of what might happen and knowing the outcome could influence it in that way. So Anna decides to take an entire syringe of A9913 because A9913 is cumulative. So the more you take, the more you would be able to see. This part was the biggest letdown and a little confusing, but stay with me. So she goes down to the pool where Pascal is supposed to kill Den. She and Pascal fight. While they're fighting, Anna is having visions of Pascal's movements, only for that to be a vision of Pascal's. So instead of just hitting Dan and then pushing him into the pool like he had originally done, he stabs him first and then walks away while Anna is trying to pull Dan from the pool. I honestly hoped this was a double bluff and it was going to be Anna who saw the vision of Pascal having the vision of her having the vision. But no, it was not the case. Redmond walks up to the building, sees the carnage, finds germ, he has a cigar in hand, enters the bunker that has suspicious fluid dripping from the ceiling. So Redmond blows both of them up. Anna and Dan make it outside and you hear sirens in the distance, but then they end on, you guessed it, an exterior shot. I wanted to like this movie so bad. I might watch it again, but the plot holes were killing me. But anyway, if you like this video and want to see more, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Why are you doing this? I wish you would surprise me.